um, we want our child to go here. And if they're accepting transfers, then they get put into onto a list. Mm -hmm. And then um, if more people apply to go there, then they, they can accept, then they'll have a little mini lottery just like charter schools have. Mm -hmm. And they can't discriminate on the basis of academic aptitude, these schools can't. And they can't discriminate on the basis of um, anything else for mm -hmm. that matter. Um, but this will allow people to cross borders. So right now, if you wanted to, if a parent wanted to send their kid to a school in another district, mm -hmm. you know, they have to get permission from their local school. And I've talked to so many parents who have said to me they tried this and their district refused to let their child go. So the only way that they could send their kid would be if they moved and got a new address or if they were able to pay to send their child to this other school. And so this, you know, this is... So no residential requirements in this right. case, right? Right. So now a family will be able to choose a school that's mm -hmm. um, far away. So this is, I mean, this is huge. That is huge. What about transportation requirements? I mean, will, um, they, will they be risk? I, if, I, if I read the bill correctly, uh, I think they will have to get their child within the district boundaries. And then, so if, if a Beaverton family is sending their child to Portland, right. they'd have to get their child within the Portland school district boundaries. Mm -hmm. And then Portland would only be responsible um, to get the child to school Within that them. area, okay. Right. But, but, but on the other hand, they still can send that child outside of the boundary, but they would be responsible right. to transport their kids. Right. Oh, wow. So they can just go anywhere. They want to go to Seaside. Well, and with the too. public transit we have in okay. um, Portland, I mean, it shouldn't be a problem if, for the most part. So, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah, so this is a huge bill, and there are. it'll be interesting to see what happens in 2012. Now, for those parents who are interested in taking advantage of this in 2012, uh, they will need to alert the school that they want to attend now. by April 1st. By April 1st. Yes, and then they will get put on a list. And if if the school's accepting transfers, some schools may decide they don't want to accept any, any out-of-district tra transfers. Um, but it will be much easier now to choose the school that you want to attend. Well, will school be required, well, at least to, to list themselves one way or the other, that their availability, if you will, for, for transfers? Uh, I, you know I'm I don't think so. I think schools that want transfers, though, will list it because this could actually really help some districts. So if they need, you know, if they need a few more students to be able to offer another program, then they could advertise. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so only state dollars will follow the student. Okay. Uh, it will not be local dollars. Um, but again, this could make a, a big dollars. difference. Okay. What's the other one? You, you three so the third one um, is the online charter school bill. So I mentioned those earlier. Those are, again, public schools. And what this bill does is it, in 2009, the legislature put an enrollment cap on charter school, on virtual charter schools. Uh, the teachers union actually brought forward a bill, Senate Bill 767, and that bill in its original form would have actually shut down all our virtual charter schools. And there were about 4,000 kids attending virtual charters at that time. And uh, so since 2009, fortunately, fortunately that bill did not pass in that form. Um, parents showed up in uh, droves, parents mm. of virtual school children, and they were sobbing on the stand, they were crying, mm. and they were saying, don't shut my kid's school, my, my kid was struggling in school before and now he's doing so well, and mm -hmm. amazing stories. Some families with kids who had medical problems who couldn't attend school for that reason. And so they, they altered the bill, um, amended it multiple times, yeah. and what finally passed put an enrollment cap on all bills, um, and it also added some other restrictions that were pretty uh, onerous, but mm -hmm. but you know they didn't close the, the schools, which was positive. So they've been looking at this issue since then because the bill also created a task force. And so what this bill that they just passed, 2301, does is it lifts the enrollment cap. So now more than 4,000 kids can, well, 4,100 or so can attend these charters, <clears throat> virtual charter schools. Mm -hmm. And <clears throat> and so, also, you don't have to get permission um, from your local district now to attend certain charter schools. Because there's, there's one school in particular that had a lot of problems here. It was Oregon Virtual Academy. A lot of families would try to send their kids to these school, this mm -hmm. school, and their district would not allow them to go. It wasn't treated like a regular charter school. And I won't bore you with the details as to okay. why, okay. but it has to do with the Oregon Department of Education granting certain kinds of waivers from certain 
certain laws. Can you highlight any specific area? Within There's a 50-50 rule with virtual charter schools. There was prior, prior to this. So basically what it said is 50% of the kids attending a virtual charter school must come from within our district, mm -hmm. within the district where the school is located. Mm -hmm. So for, for most virtual charter schools, this kind of negates the whole point of making it virtual. Mm -hmm. um, the whole idea with the, the beauty of the internet, as most people know, is that it doesn't have physical constraints. So if there's a family that's out in the middle of Eastern Oregon and they only have one school that they have the option of attending and maybe that school doesn't serve their particular kids needs, mm -hmm. maybe it's just not the right fit, a virtual charter school is an amazing option for a family that doesn't want to homeschool because maybe they don't feel qualified or maybe they want the child to be exposed to other kinds of ideas mm -hmm. or that sort of thing. But what this bill did is it, it totally negated the beauty of the internet and it said, yeah, that's not going to work. So this bill didn't apply to one school because they got grandfathered in, but did apply to another school. It was a whole legislative mess. It mm -hmm. was... Um, it was just a big mess, and it was pretty unfair um, from just a practical perspective because these schools would get treated differently. So the Oregon Department of Education had to grant waivers to um, schools from this 50-50 rule because, you know, if you're in um, SIO or if you're in, if, if the school is found in a very small district, mm -hmm. they're, they're going to be limited to a tiny enrollment. So that's the long, long story. The... Um, <clears throat> the, but the bottom line is, is now families can choose um, virtual charter schools without having to get local district permission to appoint. So mm -hmm. once 3% of the kids in their district are attending a virtual charter school, they'll have to get permission. Um, but if they're denied, they can appeal it to the state. So that's, that's still a big improvement. Mm -hmm. You know, as we're going through this, your response to this, this whole new situation, uh, let, let me ask you at this point in time, um, what about our present superintendent? What was their posture in all of this, 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 all this political process going on in, in Salem? Susan Castile, how, was she there on an ongoing basis? And was there, you mean with the whole package or yeah, with certain bills? Yeah, the whole bills? package, kind of like, you know, just a kind of a feel. Did you she was involved in some of it. I know she supported some of it. Um, I, I didn't. You didn't see too I much? I didn't see too much of what her stance was on a lot of these bills. Um, she was, you know, she was involved in the virtual charter school part as well because <clears throat> part of one of the bills actually sent the issue to the state board to look at. Mm -hmm. But again, I didn't really see her involved. I, I She attended, but I never got a feel for where she was mm -hmm. when she was there. Um, so, you know, you'd, you, maybe you should have her on. I, mean, I, think, I think it might be a very interesting thing. That's <laughs> a very interesting thing I would like to ask Susan. Now, let, let's talk about another entity. I'm talking about, the, I guess, where I'm coming from now is the teachers' union. That, that's a huge piece, if you will. And uh, it says that the, the teachers' union has said that uh, these bills will create too much financial instability. How do you respond to that? Well, it's just not true. Will it create financial instability for a school that loses many students? Mm -hmm. Yeah, if all the students want to leave the school, that school will have tr trouble. But that begs the question why do so many kids want to leave the school? And how, what was the legislature's response? I'm sure you were part of that discussion. What kind of response, what kind of interaction were you getting from both sides of the, the two major parties? On it? Well, you know, you could watch some pretty interesting, pretty tense floor debates mm. on, when these bills were up on the House floor. Um, some people were like me and they were saying, look, parents need choices. These bills make a big difference. Um, with the open enrollment bill, especially, they were, you know, some were pointing out things like, <clears throat> what about a kid whose parents move? Mm -hmm. What if they move from um, one part of, you know, Portland over into David Douglas School District? Mm -hmm. They're right next to each other. Can Should the kid have to be barred from the school just because their local district doesn't want to give them the transfer? Mm -hmm. You know, what if they move a lot? And so this, this will actually help those kids a lot. And so a lot of people were pointing out very specific examples like that and then there were a lot of people who were saying this is just going to destroy our public schools this is school choice is a bad thing and you know it's pretty frustrating for me because there's a lot of myths about 
school choice. There's other states that have incorporated far more school choice than what we have. And there's been, ever since school choice even came up, the teachers union has had these doomsday predictions that it's going to shut down our schools. It's going to, it's going to leave kids whose parents don't care about them behind and they'll, they'll fail. This mm. is, this is what I hear. Mm. It's never happened. It doesn't, it just, it's not happening out there. And in fact, <clears throat> In fact, what we're seeing is the opposite. For instance, um, Milwaukee has an mm -hmm. extensive voucher program. Mm -hmm. And what we've seen with that is that um, actually the public schools have gotten better. And that is what happens when you introduce competition is that mm -hmm. people say, okay, I, I, I'm beginning to see that some people are maybe not happy. Maybe I'm gonna try things a little bit differently to make them happy because parents, Mo the vast majority of parents want to see their kids do well in school. Mm -hmm. And so, um, you know, these doomsday predictions just don't happen. But okay. All right. what, what about another? I'm thinking about now, I'm thinking about uh, our present school, the largest school district right here in the state of Oregon, is right here in Portland, Oregon. And mo most of our, many of our viewers are, are, <coughs> are from Portland. Yeah. And what about uh, Superintendent Carol Smith? Was she there? Or was the lobbyist there? I mean, what, what did I you didn't, feel for Did you see her there? I didn't talking? see her there. No. She wasn't there. Um, I, I didn't see her there, but uh, Portland actually already has a semi-open enrollment policy within yeah. its own district, so um, it has its own system of allowing people, well it did, mm -hmm. um, of allowing people to transfer. Uh, so this, you know, this is really more of an issue with districts relating with okay. districts, mm -hmm. but her lobbyists. Uh, I shouldn't say her lobbyists. I'm sorry. I, I, I'll take Let that back. Lobbyists, <laughs> lobbyists for <laughs> school boards yes. and lobbyists for um, school administrators. Um, they were there and they were opposed to this bill. Was that right? Right. So the Oregon School Boards Association and the Confederation of um, School Administrators were there, and they they were with the OEA for, on this. Okay. Okay. Well, let's see. There was another thing I was going to add. Well, a teachers' union aspect. We kind of got into that peace aspect. Of it. Did you see them? I mean, did you see the, the the executive director, if you will, the OEA there? I mean, did you see any? any? The, the teachers' union lobbyist and then their main lobbyist was there and okay. um, not not happy about these bills. You know, they've gone on record. Their their um, their president, their leadership has gone on on record saying that they're unhappy with it because it causes financial instability. Um, they have a couple of other reasons as well. Uh, but I, just one thing about the financial st instability, I, mm -hmm. I want to clar clarify a few things. Okay. So in Oregon, according to the NEA, the National Teachers mm -hmm. Union, they, Oregon actually spends more than $10,000 per student. Okay. Yeah, on average, it's going to vary. More than $10,000 per student. Right, okay. each year. Yes. And it's going to vary from student to student depending on demographics mm -hmm. and where exactly they live. But for on average, it's ten thousand dollars per student. That's a lot of money, especially when you consider that the or the official Oregon teacher to student ratio is twenty to one. Wow. Right now, ver, now charter schools on average only get fifty five hundred dollars per student. Not to ten. Right. What happened to the money that's following the kids? Local money does not follow the student, and generally speaking, federal money does not. For charter schools, Local. generally speaking. But it's not. But it's ten thousand. Now, where are you getting that ten thousand figure? I'm, I'm, I'm just as a layperson. Well, the teachers' union has actually has a report that they issue every year. I also got figures from the Oregon Department of Education. Okay. And I got figures from um, just digging through their statements online and by emailing yeah. one of uh, the assistant superintendent there um, for information, and he sent me thirty years of information. Okay. But the teachers' union does it as well, and I like to cite their figure because we disagree with them on a lot. But we do agree with the NEA on this one on how much is actually spent because they actually include more in spending than the Oregon Department of Education. Wow. Funny enough, the ODE does not include their own budget in their per student spending. Really? So, right. <laughs> yeah, they include the spending on the district level, but they don't include how much it costs to actually operate the Oregon Department of Education and State Board. And that number is? Um, well, in uh, one year, for instance, it was about $100 per student. So we have over half a million students in Oregon. So it's a it's a lot of money. That's kind of money. Mm, interesting. Yeah. Well, hey, look, uh, this, this has been this has been quite enlightening. And what we're going to do? We're going to take a short break. And and uh, if she doesn't, I'm, I'm going to give have her give an opportunity for a close when we come back. 
and then we're going to open up the line. If, if that's okay, is that okay with you, Kim? It's fine with me. Okay, good. We're going to take a short break, and we'll be right back. You are watching Oregon Voters Digest. 